Hey everyone, I'm Zach. I'm the lead pastor here at Restore. Thanks so much for checking out this week's video. I hope that it encourages you and I hope that it inspires you. And I hope that you have some community around you to be able to talk through some of these concepts and truths with. If you don't have community like that, we would love to invite you to be a part of our community here at Restore. You can learn all about it on our website at restoreaustin.org. So click there and get all the information that you need. I hope that we see you soon at one of our gatherings, and I hope that you enjoy this message. What a week it has been. I want to begin this Sunday the same way we ended last Sunday, and that's with a little blessing adapted from Pastor Rich Viotas. No matter how you voted or if you voted at all, you are welcome in our church. I just ask that you would commit to see politics through Jesus and not Jesus through your politics that you would be curious about why your sisters and brothers see things differently instead of making assumptions about them, and that you would love Jesus and one another more than anything else. I also want to congratulate our president-elect Joe Biden and our vice president-elect Kamala Harris. It's worth noting that when Kamala Harris was born, voting discrimination based on race was legal And most Asians were banned from immigrating to the United States. But now, she will be the first woman, the first black woman, and the first South Asian woman to serve as the vice president. I don't care who you voted for. I believe that is something worth celebrating. And to all the women listening right now, if you've been told that you don't belong in leadership because of your gender, that was a lie. You absolutely belong. You belong in the White House, you belong in the boardroom, you belong in the pastorate, and you belong in every other leadership position across this world. Don't ever let anyone tell you otherwise. I'm inviting everyone to join me in praying for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as they embark on the difficult task of bringing our country together to solve the many issues we are facing. I'm also calling on everyone to do one last thing. And I want to actually speak to two groups of people for a moment. Those who are happy with the election results and those who are not. For those of you who are happy, I want to challenge you with this scripture. All of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. There's nothing wrong with being excited about your candidates winning, but there is something wrong with gloating, with mocking, Be tender-hearted, the scripture says. Have a humble attitude and be respectful of those who are upset about the election results. Don't stereotype people. Don't make assumptions about them. Don't group them all together in one big category. Actually listen to people. Seek to understand why they are upset or scared or uncertain. Treat people like they are God's image bearers worth listening to because they are. Even if you are being insulted, scripture says repay insult with blessing because that's what God's called you to do and he will bless you for it. Remember, there is nothing Christ-like about being prideful, about being mean-spirited. Now, for those of you who are unhappy with the results, I want to challenge you with that same scripture. All of you should be of one mind, sympathize with each other, love each other as brothers and sisters, be tender-hearted, and keep a humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. Don't get angry. Don't lash out. Yes, those who won should be humble in victory, but you also need to be gracious in defeat. As a Christian, you are called to be gracious in defeat, even if the victor is not being humble. And don't throw a fit either. Don't make unsubstantiated claims. Don't buy into baseless conspiracy theories because you wish the outcome was different. There's nothing Christ-like about spreading disinformation. 
So regardless of whether you are happy or unhappy about the election, as Peter said in the passage we just read, the time has come for us to come together, sympathize with each other, and love one another as brothers and sisters, as children of God. I'm going to pray that we do exactly that, and then we're going to dive in to today's message. Let's pray. God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for waking us up after a long week. God, we come together as a church family here at Restore and as churches all across this world, and we pray for every one of our elected leaders. We pray for President Trump as he finishes out his elected term. We pray for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as they prepare to transition into this difficult role. And we pray for elected leaders all over our cities, counties, states, country, and world as they lead people. We pray that they would do so with humble hearts. They would do so with your kingdom's purposes of loving our neighbor as ourselves in the forefront of their minds. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I can't believe we are already on week 12 of our year in the life of Jesus. If you've missed either of the first two series in our year, you can find them on YouTube, Vimeo, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Just search Restore Austin and it will pop up. We've been walking through this life of Jesus now since August. And this morning, we start a brand new series. And it is called Sermon on the Mount. Now, the title is purposefully not catchy or creative because... The message that Jesus preaches, which has become known as the Sermon on the Mount, is so radical that it needs no pomp and circumstance. It speaks for itself. But before we dive in, let me set the scene for us a little bit. See, Jesus has just finished everything we covered in our series coming up to this one. He has been baptized by John the Baptist. He's overcome temptation from Satan in the wilderness. He has preached his first message at his hometown synagogue in Nazareth and chosen his incredibly diverse and somewhat controversial disciples to be his apprentices, to follow him everywhere and learn from him. Matthew ends chapter 4 of his account of Jesus' life with this summary paragraph. He says, Jesus went throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news that is the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread all over Syria, and people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those who were suffering from severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. So Jesus is an absolute celebrity at this point. He is healing people, he's casting out demons, he's teaching with power, and huge crowds are turning out to hear him speak. And then one day, at the height of his popularity, Jesus makes this decision to deliver his magnum opus sermon the teaching that will undergird every other message he ever gives. You see, the Sermon on the Mount is viewed by both religious and non-religious people alike as one of the most influential speeches ever given. I love how Philip Yancey describes the Sermon on the Mount in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew. He says, though I've tried at times to dismiss it as rhetorical excess, the more I study Jesus, the more I realize that the statements contained here lie at the heart of his message. If I fail to understand this teaching, I fail to understand him. Jesus delivered the famous sermon at a time when his popularity was soaring. Crowds pursued him everywhere he went, obsessed with one question, has the Messiah, the Savior of the world, come at last? On this unusual occasion, Jesus skipped the parables and granted his audience a full-blown philosophy of life, somewhat like a candidate unveiling a new political platform. And what a platform. What a platform it is. That is why we're spending an entire series during our year in the life of Jesus walking through this teaching. The Sermon on the Mount is Jesus' crowning teaching. It's his longest teaching, and it's his most robust teaching. It's the instruction for us as we live as his followers, as disciples of Jesus. So without further ado, here's what he said. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. 
Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who, persecu- who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you. When people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me, rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way, they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, when we hear that teaching and we hear the word blessed, I don't know if it really sinks in what Jesus is actually trying to convey here. And I think it could be because we've heard this passage so many times. If if you grew up in church, you've been in church for a long time, you've heard this a lot of times, and maybe it just doesn't really sink in anymore. It's, It's lost its punch a little bit. Or maybe it's because we associate the word blessed with something like, bless your heart, due to the fact that everything listed here is often considered negative. So when Jesus is talking about those who mourn or those who are struggling or those who are poor in spirit and he says, blessed, we think like, oh, Jesus is just kind of saying, bless your heart. That's hard, but I'm with you. Or it could be because we think of blessed in the future sense only. Like those things all sound terrible right now, but Jesus is going to bless them in the end. If they just stay faithful through all of the junk they're going through, blessing will come eventually. It'll work out all right. But listen, none of those explanations do the words of Jesus justice here. The modern definition of the word blessed is really a misleading translation of the original Greek word. It isn't a term that tells us who God is rewarding or who he will reward. This word denotes someone who has an enviable place in life. An enviable place in life. A person who is experiencing something that everyone looks at and sees and they say, I want what they have. New Testament scholar David Bentley Hart gives us a much better picture of the original language and context when he translates blessed blissful to fully understand why all of the folks that Jesus mentioned have a blissful and enviable position in life. We need to actually go back for a second. Look back at an often overlooked part of interpreting the Sermon on the Mount. Do you remember what Jesus was up to right before he began preaching? We just read about it, Matthew chapter 4, a moment ago. It says he was healing people who were dealing with sickness, demon possession, paralysis, seizures, severe pain, various other diseases. Now, Matthew doesn't come out and say it directly because he didn't have to. Everyone reading this originally would have already known, but this list of people that Jesus is ministering to, they're social outcasts. They are pariahs. They are misfits who were considered so unclean that they were not allowed to interact with the rest of the community. These folks were the definition of marginalized, pushed out to the margins of society. The healings and then subsequently the sermon are yet another example of Jesus continuing this great reversal in both word and deed. If you've been with us on our journey throughout the year in the life of Jesus, you've seen this great reversal time and time again. You see, Jesus is not only tolerating those that society said were intolerable, he's seeking out those who've been left out. He's touching those who were called untouchable, and he's welcoming in people who have been cast aside. The great reversal. Fuller Seminary professor Joel Green says, these beatitudes are words of hope and comfort to people like those who have already been the recipients of Jesus' ministry. Lepers, sinners, the demonized, tax collectors, women, and so on. Unacceptable in the socially defined world in which they live, they are not only tolerated, but embraced and restored in the new world that Jesus proclaims and embodies. The great reversal. We are going to walk through these beatitudes one by one to help them really sink in and to help us really get a better understanding of what Jesus was trying to say. I'm going to use that David Bentley Hart translation that I mentioned earlier because it paints such a vivid picture of what Jesus was saying and stays so true to the original text. So remember, this is a continuation of this great reversal as Jesus introduces more and more of what God's kingdom is all about. This thing, God's kingdom, that he talked more about than any other subject. 
and how this kingdom, God's kingdom, is radically different from the kingdoms of this world. So here we go, one by one, let's go through them. In a culture that believed religiosity was what brought blessing, Jesus begins by saying, how blissful the destitute, the abject in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. He's saying there is a bliss, there is a joy in understanding that no amount of religion can make us righteous. Only by understanding our own brokenness, our own spiritual objection, can we be made new by Jesus. Next, in a culture that believed dominance and toughness was what brought good fortune, Jesus actually says, how blissful those who mourn, for they will be aided. How blissful the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. He's saying there is a joy in allowing yourself to feel emotions, to process them internally and to be open about them externally. You see, when we do that, we receive support, Jesus says, from God. And not just spiritually from God, but also through our brothers and sisters as well. There is also a joy in moving through the world with gentleness. Being gentle is not weakness, it's actually strength. Gentleness is born out of security. When we know we belong to Jesus and we know he will take care of us, we are freed from the need to dominate. Next, in a culture that believed happiness came from these lavish parties with all the best food and all the best wine, Jesus says, how blissful those who hunger and thirst for what is right, for they shall feast. I love that. They shall feast. There's joy in having a voracious appetite for what truly satisfied, not the things that will leave you hungry and thirsty again and again. Remember, Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Next, in a culture that believed the greatest rulers were the ones who showed no mercy on the battlefield, Jesus says, how blissful the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. How blissful the pure in heart, for they shall see God. There is joy in coming to a deep understanding of the great mercy God has shown us. And when we do that, we will begin overflowing with that mercy and showing it to every single person we encounter. I remember asking a pastor friend once why she was always so kind to everyone, no matter the circumstances. And she said, Zach, I've just never gotten over how kind Jesus is to me. To this day, She's still one of the most joy-filled people I know because she understands the depth of kindness and mercy that has been shown to her and that allows her to show it to every other person. Next, in an honor and shame culture where blessings came from never challenging the status quo, Jesus says, how blissful the peacemakers for they shall be called sons of God. Now you may be thinking, What does not challenging the status quo have to do with peacemaking? Well, we're going to come back to that in just a moment, talk about what peacemaking actually is and why it's so important. But before we do that, let me wrap up the last one. Because in a culture where the two most blessed entities, that was the Jewish temple and the Roman government, were quick to oppress anyone who threatened their power, Jesus says, how blissful those of you who have been persecuted for the sake of what is right. For theirs is the kingdom of the heavens. How blissful when they reproach you and persecute you and falsely accuse you of every evil for my sake. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is in heaven is great. For thus they persecuted the prophets before you. He is saying there is joy, there is bliss in what is coming for you. Those who seek their reward here on earth alone will be sorely disappointed when their time comes. But those of us who know that when we store things up here on earth, they rot and they are destroyed. But when we store things up in heaven, they never rot. They are never destroyed. There is bliss. There is joy in knowing that and leaning into that in this life. This is the great reversal. It's crazy, but really try to understand and let it sink in that these characteristics are truly enviable 
They actually lead to great joy when we understand that not only is the kingdom of God radically different from the kingdoms of this world, it's actually better. It's better than anything we can experience here. The ways of Jesus are better than the ways of this world. I hope many of those Beatitudes spoke to you as we walk through them one by one just now. But I want to spend the rest of our time together focusing in on one that I believe is so vitally important in this cultural moment. In an honor and shame culture where blessings came from never challenging the status quo, Jesus says, how blissful the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Now, I don't know if you noticed here, but of all the characteristics Jesus describes in Matthew 5 in his Sermon on the Mount, peacemaker is the only one listed with an identity instead of a reward. It's the only one listed with an identity instead of a reward. You see, instead of being blessed or comforted or shown mercy, it says peacemakers will be called sons of God. That's an identity. It's not a reward. In that culture, firstborn sons were representatives for their whole family on behalf of the fathers. They wore signet rings with the family crest that wherever they went on behalf of the father and the family, they could dip them in ink or hot wax and they could actually sign legal documents, binding documents on behalf of the family. They wore family robes that were passed down generations and generations from fathers to sons. Do you remember the story of the prodigal son, right? You have this kid who, who doesn't want to be in the family anymore, and he tells his dad, I wish you were dead. Just give me all your money and let me go do my thing. And he goes and does his thing, and he finds out just how little bliss and joy there is in running away from what the father has for him. And so he comes back, and what is the first thing the father does? Do you remember the story? He comes over the hill. The father sees him. The father runs to him. The son starts this uh, rehearsed apology. The father doesn't even let him finish it. He interrupts him. You remember what he says? He says, go get the robe, a family robe, put it on him. Get the sandals, put them on his feet and bring the ring, put it on his finger. He was being welcomed back into this representation of the family as going out as a representative of the father, the ring, the robe, the sandals. He was fully welcomed back in. That was the power of kind of fathers and sons in that culture. So when it says that peacemakers are sons of God, it's saying that we are actually acting on God's behalf every time we pursue peacemaking. We are his representatives Here's another way of thinking about it. We are never more representative of God and his mission than when we are peacemaking. All the rest of them have a reward. Peacemaking has an identity. When we are peacemaking, we are wearing that ring, wearing that robe, going out as representatives of God and his kingdom and doing what he has for us to do. So what is peacemaking? Because it's not enough to just say we should be peacemaking. We have to know what it is. Well, I'm convinced that the American church needs a much better definition of peace than the one we are currently working with. When we speak of peace, we're usually referring to the opposite of war, right? War and peace, the famous novel. There's peacetime. There's wartime. We, we really see it as the absence of conflict. But my friends, it is so much more than that. Biblical peace is the pursuit of abundant peace goodness in all things and between all things. I've seen many Christian leaders rightly calling for peace this week as the election came to a close, but there's a radical difference between peacekeeping and peacemaking. Let me explain what I mean. Peacekeepers try to make everyone happy, but peacemakers try to make everyone equal. Peacekeepers maintain the status quo, but peacemakers are change agents in pursuit of fixing the brokenness in our world. Peacekeepers call for compromise, but peacemakers are willing to call out racism, sexism, classism, and every other oppressive ism, even when it makes people uncomfortable. Let me give you some examples. Proponents of Jim Crow were often called peacemakers, or excuse me, peacekeepers, because they felt that separate water fountains, separate schools, and restaurants for people of color was a good way to compromise between former slave owners and newly freed black people. 
but Martin Luther King and others like him were not peacekeepers. They were peacemakers. Dr. King fought for equity so hard that he was frequently arrested uh, by the police. He was uh, targeted and investigated by the FBI. He was eventually shot and killed for all the things that he pursued. He was a peacemaker. Another example. Those who opposed women's suffrage were called peacekeepers. No reason to rock the boat. At that point, women were doing way better than they ever had. Why push it and let them vote? Susan B. Anthony didn't agree. She wasn't a peacekeeper. She was a peacemaker. She protested. She voted illegally. She even went to jail as she pursued true peace in all things and between all things. Here's another example. The religious leaders of the first century, the time of Jesus, they were peacekeepers. They kept people in constant fear of God's anger by saying he only loved them if they kept all the rules. And they believed this would kind of keep everyone in line. They tried to make this deal with the occupying Roman government so that they could do some things and Rome could do some things. And they were just trying to keep the peace. But God didn't like being misrepresented by the ones that claimed to be his followers. So he left heaven, came to earth in the person of Jesus Christ to let everyone know once and for all that God's love was freely available to anyone and everyone who wanted it. Jesus was a peacemaker. He confronted the religious leaders, even flipping over their tables in the temple courts, exposing them as frauds. And then in the most incredible peacemaking act in history, he died for the sins of the world. But then three days later, he rose from the grave, conquering death and exposing the broken, peacekeeping ways of our society. The peacekeepers killed Jesus. Let that sink in with you for a second. The peacekeepers killed Jesus. He was a peacemaker. Peacemaking is not standing in the uncontroversial middle and just trying to placate everyone. It's not calling for unity while refusing to deal with marginalization in our community. That's peacekeeping. Peacemaking is standing for truth and justice and equity for all people, no matter the cost. Because we recognize as Christian peacekeepers that all people are made in the image of God. That all people have been given dominion from Genesis, from the very beginning, called to shepherd and lead. For us as Christians, the choice between peacekeeping and peacemaking is clear. Blessed and blissful are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God. And listen, because here's the huge key in actually making this happen in our lives. If you are a Christian, this radical peacemaking Jesus, he lives in you. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. That peacemaking Jesus by the Holy Spirit lives in me and you. And if you'll allow him to, Jesus will work through you the same way he worked when he was here on earth. Through Jesus, we are not relegated to peacekeeping. We are empowered with the difficult but joyous job of peacemaking. So as we finish up this morning, here's a question that each of us are compelled to answer. Am I a peacekeeper or a peacemaker? Am I a peacekeeper or a peacemaker? maker. There's great temptation to be a peacekeeper right now, not to rock the boat, not to challenge the status quo, but my friends, that is not the way of Jesus. It is time for the church to stand up and be peacemakers. I want to leave you with this challenging quote from a pastor friend named Thomas Horrocks. He says, Christian peacemaking is not about taking a neutral stand between both sides. Christian peacemaking is about taking a firm stance on the side of truth and justice and inviting others to join in. May we all, may we all take a firm stance on the side of truth and justice. And not because it's popular, not because it's politically correct, but because that, my friends, is where Jesus stands. 
Let's pray. Our God, thank you for what you were doing in our world. Thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you that by your Holy Spirit, Jesus, you indwell us and your peacemaking ways can be our peacemaking ways if we will allow you to lead. So Jesus, by your spirit, lead us. Lead us into the dark parts of our communities where people are hurting and struggling and help us bring peace to them. Lead us to the the fringes of society where people are downtrodden and cast aside and help us bring peace to them. God, you are gonna do it because this is what you have always done. And so I humbly ask that you would let me just be a part of it, that you would let us be a part of it, that you would use us, our church family, to bring peace in our world. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.